My name is Mandy Camps. I'm with the DNR and the Wildlife Rehabilitation Program. This week is Keep Wildlife Wild Week, and we wanted to check in with a wildlife rehab center to see what kind of calls, what kind of contacts they're seeing, because it is spring season already. And so other information we'll get when we head inside is how to determine if a young animal is in need of assistance, how to transport it appropriately, and get any, any other tips from the wildlife rehabilitators. So if you happen to have any questions, feel free to enter them in the comments while we're um, live today, and we'll try to get answers to them uh, as soon as we can. So let's head on inside. Hi everybody, my name is Paige Peterson. I'm one of the licensed rehabilitators here at the Dane County Main Studies Wildlife Center, and we're happy to have Mandy here with us today so we can talk a little bit more about wildlife rehabilitation and what to do if you find an animal in the wild and you think needs help. Um, so here at the Wildlife Center, we work with um, sick, injured, orphaned animals, um, and we see about 4,000 animals annually um, with a wide range of species. So mammals, birds, raptors, reptiles, um, a whole slew of different things. And all of our animals in care right now um, are, are sick or injured, and so um, to help them heal, we always want to limit stress. So we won't have any animals out for you guys to see today, but I did think we could give you a little behind the scenes peek at the Wildlife yeah. Center and give you a little tour as you walk through, and then we can talk about some more common scenarios um, as well. Awesome. So this is yeah, our reception great. area. So if a member of the public finds an injured animal, this is where you would come. Um, and we have receptionists that would help you fill out paperwork um, and get that animal into our system. Um, through this window, our viewing window here, this is actually um, one of our bat rooms. So this winter, we're overwintering a little over 100 bats. This is our warm bat room. Um, in a different season, we'll use this as a nursery space. We might have young mammals in there. So come on back. As we're walking, if you guys have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments and we will try to get them answered. Uh, if we can't answer them live, we will answer them later. Okay, so we're gonna stop here. To my right over here is our avian room and through the window, you guys can see we set up a little fake cage for you. So this is a room that we might house some of our songbird species like robins or our fake little cardinal bear. Um, we also, for young patients, um, hatchling or fledgling birds, um, they can't thermoregulate yet on their own, so we might actually house them in something like an incubator where we're feeding them frequently and help keeping their temperature warm. So come on further in. The space over here is our mammal room, so we might have things like possums or squirrels, and I pulled a little example of a cage out for you. Um, we really try and keep all of our cages very natural, and so the patients feel um, like they're at home and they feel comfortable and they recognize some of those natural materials from the wild. So you see we use lots of um, leaves and branches and things like that in our cages. So come on through. This is our kitchen area. We see a lot of animals, so we have a lot of dishes. <laughs> With such a wide variety of animals coming in, you can kind of see behind me, we have all sorts of different types of foods. Um, depending on the species, we see um, upwards of 100 different types of species here at the Wildlife Center. Everyone has a really specialized diet, so we try and take that into account, and so that's what you're seeing mm -hmm. behind me here. <laughs> Great. Um, so thanks for giving us a little quick tour here of your center and giving us an idea of how many animals you see every year. Um, it's a lot of animals that you serve, and you're here in Madison, so yep. it's probably um, a big urban area mm -hmm. and a wide area outside that you also receive calls from. Um, so I guess, what are some calls that you're getting this time of year? It is spring out there, although it really doesn't feel like it today. Um, so what are kind yep. of the calls that you're getting, and what are some tips that you can give to people to help them if they're outside, um, experiencing getting outdoors a little bit more, and maybe coming in contact with some young animals? Yeah, so summer, spring and summer are busiest seasons because we're not only working with injured adults, but we might be having um, situations where babies are orphaned um, or separated mm -hmm. from their parents. So um, if someone is finding an injured animal or you see something that's questionable, we always suggest you call your local wildlife rehabilitator mm -hmm, um, or you can um, call the DNR um, mm -hmm. and they have a great um, listing of rehabilitators so you can find one that's local to your area. It's always important when you kind of take an animal to the closest rehabilitator um, to limit stress and to get that, that patient care as soon as possible. We'll put some yeah. links in the comments after this too so that people can easily find their nearest one. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. 
If you um, do have an injured animal um, and you need to bring it into us, um, some things to consider um, is how you might house that animal appropriately to keep it safe and to keep yourself safe. So behind Mandy are a few different examples. Um, things like cardboard boxes work really well. Um, as long as they have air holes, you can see I just used some pencil sized air holes in here. Um, and inside your boxes, you just wanna use materials that um, don't have any loops or snags in them. So things like t-shirt material, fleece, um, pillowcases work well. Those are really important to keep the animal safe. Um, you can use things like pet carriers, um, but things like metal sides can be hard on feathers if you have a bird patient. So lining the inside um, with some sort of soft material is important. And you just have some clothespins on there, right? Yeah, these are just clothespins, yep. Um, and you can, here at the Wildlife Center, we use Rubbermaid containers um, that we've actually put holes in too, but if you have something like this at home that you need to use, um, but it doesn't have any holes for breathing in it, you could just instead use like a cardboard top and some handy duct tape to cover the top. Um, and I have a sheet here as well. This one, when it's clear, it's really important to like limit stimulus for these guys and limit stress, so limiting anything um, visual or noise. So if you can cover them um, or put them in a space that is quiet, you know, away from TV, radio, until you can get it as soon as possible to your rehabilitator, that's important as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So. You know, these are calls where um, if you've already talked to a wildlife rehabber like Paige or anybody else here in the Madison area and the animal does need assistance, those are, those are some great ways to transport the animal to them um, safely and to do that as soon as possible. So preferably within 24 hours of when an animal is found um, to get them as soon as possible to you guys here for some extra help. And that's of course if the animal is injured, if it's sick, or if it is truly orphaned. We get a lot of calls on uh, people coming across some young mammals, mm -hmm. especially this time of year, coming up on some young uh, bird calls as well. And they might see an animal in the yard, but think it's orphaned, but maybe it's not. Exactly. So we have some tips too to help you kind of figure out if an animal is truly orphaned. Exactly, so mm -hmm. if you come across a young animal um, in your yard, and it might be okay, or it might be something is wrong. So talking um, with a professional can help you sort out that situation. And being raised in the wild by the mom or by the parents is absolutely the best case scenario for all of our wild babies out there. Um, and so we do our very best to help people reunite animals if we can with their mom. So one of the common calls we get is about baby squirrels. Um, common scenario might be, uh, you know, they cut down a tree and they found all this nest of babies in the tree mm -hmm. trunk. Um, but now they're worried, mom's not there, what should we do with them? And so that's a really great scenario um, where we can try and reunite those babies with mom. The squirrels will often have um, a second nest site mm -hmm. um, and mom's usually still in the area then and she'd be looking for her baby. So I um, have some examples here of what you can do for baby mammals. It's important um, for a young patient, a uh, young baby to be warm, or otherwise the mom might not take him back. Um, so having things like a hot water bottle um, you can make one yourself just with a plastic bottle and warm water. It would be important though to cover these um, with fleece or with um, t-shirt material so that a baby is not right up against that hot material so mm -hmm. there's a little bit of a barrier. You can make yourself some lovely rice socks. They work really well. You can heat them up in the microwave. Um, or if you do have something like a snuggle safe disc or a heating pad that you have in your home that you could put under um, just a portion of uh, the container to keep the baby warm. And then I've just shown an example of some shoe boxes is what all you need to do is, is tuck in one of these warm materials into the box. If you have the nesting materials, um, like a, the whole nest of squirrels came out of the tree, you can put that all together in the container or you can make your own and using some t-shirt material or some fleece if necessary to help keep that baby warm um, and allow time for mom to come back and pick it up. Um, and working with the rehabilitator can tell you, you know, how long should you leave that baby out there before, before you should be concerned and get it into care instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's great. Um, really great advice. And it's leaving you know, these boxes and containers close to where mm -hmm. um, the nest was found. You don't want to move them too far just so the mom uh, makes sure if she's still in the area, she can find them. And then definitely working with your rehabilitator um, as you're going through the process and uh, getting the next steps and some other advice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, depending on if mom comes back, great. That's what we like. Yeah. We like to reunite them. Exactly. But um, but yeah, if she's not around for some reason or doesn't come back, then it's making that call again to the, um, to the rehabber uh, just to 
get the next uh, bit of advice on how to transport them to them if needed. I had a really wonderful experience a few years ago. I went out, we had a, a nest of five baby squirrels that uh, they were cut out of a tree and I went back and I put them out at the base of the tree where it was and I went and sat in my car and I watched and within 10 minutes mom was there and carrying her babies away to her new nest. It was so rewarding. So it's, it's such an awarding um, experience to know that you can get this baby back with its mom and it's so important and it's really great um, for families to be involved in and to know that they were able to be successful with that. Yeah, definitely. Well, moving on from squirrels, another mm -hmm. common um, animal and call we get is about baby bunny and baby bunny nests. That's a really common one. People will often, uh, maybe when you're gardening or you're doing some landscaping this spring as you're getting ready um, to plant flowers or plant a garden, you might come across a rabbit nest. It's surprising this weather, but we already <laughs> have calls about baby bunnies and nests. They're already there. Um, and so they're often very unobtrusive. You might not notice that they're in your nest, they're in your yard until you stumble across it, either by disturbing the nest yourself perhaps, or maybe you have a pet, like a dog outside that mm -hmm. got into a nest. Um, and rabbits are, are, they grow really, really quickly. It's really surprising mm -hmm. when I first learned. They only spend about three to four weeks in the nest before they're fully independent. So they're only about the size mm -hmm. of your fist. <laughs> by the time their eyes are open, their ears are up, and they leave the nest and they're on their own. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's amazing once you find a nest, often it's not very long until those babies will be independent. Um, and so reuniting or re-nesting them is a really easy thing to do. Um, mm -hmm. Down here on the table, I have an example using some blades of grass of making a tic-tac-toe pattern. So one of the things, if, if you've disturbed a nest, you found some babies, you wanna check to make sure that mom is coming back to the nest. Mom will only come uh, twice a day. She comes at dawn and dusk. And so if you uh, put this tic-tac-toe pattern over top of the nest, you can come see the next day if she's disturbed the pattern. She's dug down to her babies to feed them um, and then repacked them. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, I suggest always taking a photo of it. If you make yourself a little tic-tac-toe, take a photo and you can compare it the next day. It works really mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Um, another uh, case we often hear about is, well, I have a dog in my yard and I don't want, now the dog knows where the nest is. I don't want him to go straight mm -hmm. back there. You know, it's a fenced in yard or he doesn't like being on a leash. So I just want him to let him mm -hmm. out. Well, what you can do, because mom only comes twice a day at dawn and dusk, uh, you can use a handy laundry basket. And this works really well that you can actually just put this over the top of the nest during the day and weight it down with some bricks or other heavy material. Um, it's just important that at night, by, what, by at least 8 o'clock, you take that basket off so then mom can have access to her babies again that evening to feed them and again in the morning. And then when you go back out before you let your dog out the next morning, you could replace the nest in the morning, the basket in the morning to keep those babies safe. Um, and again, these guys are only in the nest for about three to four weeks. So often by the time you find them, they might be a couple weeks old. So it is often an inconvenience, but it works really, really well. And it's so mm -hmm. rewarding to watch those guys grow and then leave the nest. Any tips for um, like mowing your yard um, and watching for them while you're mowing? That's a really great idea. Um, we suggest, or suggest that people kind of walk through their yard to start with um, before they mow. Um, often if you have babies that have just dispersed from the nest and they're still small, they might mm -hmm. have scattered away, you'll scare them out of your mowing path if you just walk your perimeter. Um, oftentimes you can see where there might be a trouble or a spot where maybe there is a nest if there's a divot in the ground. The nests are, are really flat to the surface and they, the rabbits will dig a hole and then cover their babies on top. Um, and they cover it with um, dry materials, but also a lot of rabbit fur. So if you are seeing rabbit fur in a certain spot in your yard, that's a hint that maybe there actually is a nest underneath there. So mm -hmm. I suggest if you just make a, uh, you know, a pathway through or walk through your yard or um, before you landscape or before you mow, that's a good way to check and see if there's any, any nest there, any bunnies that they can get out of your way then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and with the mother rabbit, her best way to protect her young is to hide them like that mm -hmm. in the nest so well. So it'll be covered really well in, in the yard, in the grass, it'll have that dry material over it, and that's her best way to protect them. So if you see that, just kind of make note of it, let the nest be for a while, if they're okay, you know, if there's any concern about them, at least, um, you know, about the young ones, definitely give a call to mm -hmm. a rehabber just to get a little bit more information. 
Um, but, but that's really a good thing to know is that that's the best way that the mother can protect her young is to hide them like that. And she's not around them. She can't protect them herself mm -hmm. from a predator. So a good thing to remember is how well they're camouflaged into their yes. nest. Yes, yep, yep. Those nests are really mm -hmm. quite hidden. We always have some here on the property. Um, at DCHS Wildlife Center here, we see wild rabbits outside. We know there must be nests around, but we rarely ever actually see one, which is amazing to mm -hmm. us. So you might see that you have adult rabbits in your yard and you'll never find a nest, but if you do, now you know some tips. Mm -hmm. um, so another common thing we also hear about and talk about soon will be maybe birds, um, fledglings uh, or hatchlings that are falling out of the nest. Mm -hmm. um, we see robins are a really common one. They nest like to nest in urban areas. Mm -hmm. They're starting to. They're starting to build those nests, even though it's kind of chilly out yet. Yes. <laughs> yep. I've been. We've been hearing calls and seeing some posts on our Facebook uh, about people about robins being in territory fights. Mm -hmm. um, so we know that they um, are looking to start nesting um, and having yeah. their babies soon. Um, and, and birds um, that are naked, if, they're, if you see a baby bird on the ground that you see mostly most of its skin, it looks naked to you, um, that's a baby that definitely should be in a nest still, um, and it shouldn't be on the ground. Um, and so often, they, they can't move very far, so often if you're able to just look above you um, and look for a nest, but at the same time, there's also lots of different species in Wisconsin that nest close to the ground. So maybe it came out of a bush or something nearby. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something if you're talking with your local rehabilitator, um, they can help you identify what species it is and maybe what type of place you're looking for to be able to re-nest that baby. Mm -hmm. um, and you can use things, um, if, you, if you found the nest, if the whole nest fell out of the tree um, and you know where it came from, um, you can put it back up into that space and, and watch for moms using something um, like a wicker basket, something that has um, drainage holes so that water can go through and it doesn't get too wet in the nest. And using um, natural materials, if you have the original nest, that's great to put it in there. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you don't want to use anything that could absorb water like towels um, or fleece, anything like that, because that will make the babies too wet. Um, but putting it, the nest back up right where, where it came from and watching for the parents to come back um, sometimes works really well. Um, and that's something um, that can be enjoyable too. You can mm -hmm. you know, watch from your windows and have the whole family involved in watching to see if the parents are coming back. And um, it's yeah. quite rewarding when they do. Yeah. Yeah, and even if you don't have a little basket like this, you have a couple of other options yeah. here that some items you might have more of a chance of having at your house. Yeah, any type of um, you know bowl type material, um, so a plastic container, you just want to make sure you drill holes in the bottom and mm -hmm. you use something like this so that any rainwater can pass through okay. Um, and then um, using zip ties or twine or anything like that just to secure it in the tree or a bush or wherever you think that nest originally was. It's important to be as close as possible to where it was and then you mm -hmm. monitor to see if the parents are coming back. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, we have some great advice here for um, if you find a young squirrel and reuniting it with its mother or, or trying to do that if she's still around. With rabbits as well, we have a great setup here and, and some ways that you can um, put that crisscross pattern over a nest to see if the mother's still around there too. And of course, if we have some young nestling birds that happen to fall out of nests and getting some really great advice on um, how to try and reunite those um, young as well. So if you can't tell by now, a common theme, theme we've been talking about today is how to determine if a young animal is in need of assistance, uh, kind of explaining some of the natural history about the species a little bit, and so what are some ways that we can do, or some ways that we can try and figure out if um, the young animal is truly orphaned and it does really need to be brought into one of our licensed wildlife rehabilitators. So it's great. Um, thank you very yeah. much for talking with us today. Um, of course. We're in, in Madison, again, at the Dane County Humane Society's Wildlife Center, um, and they serve the big area uh, around here, around yes. the Madison area, so a lot of animals. We heard how many they got every year. And so all of this information, some of this um, advice, certainly call your, your closest wildlife rehabilitator to you. Um, you can go to even web, website pages that they have. We have our own web pages that we can um, add in, again, some of those links to and some of the comments. Um, today to the conversation so you can get some of this information you can have it and um, keep it just in case you run into any scenario or situation like this um, sometime this spring or summer so with that thanks again for joining us and thank you all